All right, today we are gonna get involved with some different business applications. Um, I've been doing a lot of Salesforce stuff on the channel and this is still Salesforce related, but it's actually going to be some other business applications that you might be running into. And if you're not, you should probably consider them because they're super helpful to have within your org to get things connected to Salesforce and just make your life a lot easier. So today we're gonna be talking about a little tool called Zapier and what the purpose of this entire episode or this video is going to be about is setting it up so that we can connect Salesforce alerts to hit our Slack. Now, Slack is a, another business application that's used for communication. Um, I've used it at several companies now. Uh, really, really nice to use, huge company to use. Um, so if you don't have a communication tool, I'd consider Slack. Um, but it's a common problem because a lot of us use it. So we're going to figure out how in this specific use case, we can make a closed one go over to our Slack and notify whoever it was that closed it, right? Or whoever it was that was on the case. So that's what we want to do. It gives them a nice little DM. Um, they're able to just look at it that way versus like having to look at a report or anything else. It just lets them know, hey, this, this deal was closed. So that's what we're gonna show you how to do today. Uh, and you can really apply this, like what we're going to show up as far as like the basics, you can apply it to really anything that we do. Um, you could set it up on any other object if you really wanted to. So let's hurry and jump over to my portfolio, my blog here. So on my blog, basically what we have is um, everything that I post. So anything from Salesforce hacks, business applications like we're doing today, uh, podcasts around FAQ with Salesforce, and then you know thoughts around just stuff that I've been trying to do to improve my career if that interests you. So feel free to jump over here and check it out. Um, there's obviously a post that we're going to be jumping into for this one specifically, Salesforce and Zapier, or I think it's actually Zapier. I always call it Zapier, but it's Zapier. And uh, it has all the breakdown of what we're doing and it's all written out. So if you just wanna look at the documentation, if that's a lot easier for you versus watching this video and trying to follow along or if that's just not your jam, feel free to jump over here because we're gonna kind of jump into it. Okay. So I want to have this pulled up uh, for context because actually what I want to do since I made these blog posts a while ago before I started doing videos, I just want to go through it step by step of what I've written down and work you guys through it. So that way, if you're looking at the documentation, this is just a video of like, hey, proof in the pudding. This is what I wrote. This is how I would go about doing it. So our very first step that we got to do, uh, we want this message right to go out when there's a closed one. And what we want it to do is we want to hit the case owner. Um, when it goes over to the case owner, we're going to let them know, hey, this deal was closed one, right? And just let them know. Now, like I said, it doesn't have to be on a case. It doesn't have to be on an opportunity. Um, hence this right here, your desired object. And you can use this same principle to really anything you're trying to do in Zapier. This is just like an easy thing for me to set up and what I chose to do. You can do whatever you want with whatever object you want. Um, so that's what we're going to be doing. So the very first thing that I would recommend doing is there's something called a Slack member ID. A Slack member ID is exactly like your, um, what is it? It's like your user ID in Salesforce, right? So they give you some type of ID to recognize you once you've been set up. Uh, that number never changes. It's unique to your user. Uh, same ID in Salesforce, right? So if you head on over to your Slack, there's a couple ways to get it. Okay, so one, we could click on this user who is me and you could click over to see what it actually is. If you go over and uh, hover over your more, your settings there, the three dots, there's this member ID, right? And I could copy it. And if that's your use case where you just needed like one specific person, feel free to do it this way. That's a lot easier. You don't have to really get into anything and you don't need admin permissions to be able to find this in Slack. So if that's you, you can copy it right here. Um, for our use case though, let's say we have like an entire team. We need everybody in the company. We need all their IDs. Um, then if that's the case for you, I would suggest going to the user on uh, the user object in Salesforce and I would add a new field. I did this on my own company and obviously here on my test one. And what I did is I titled it uh, Slack member ID. And then I created a, you know, just a, another field that was a text field. And then I exported all of these member IDs and then put them into um, 
Salesforce. That way I never really have to worry about it again. I can access it from Salesforce. All that stuff is going to work in my favor to do it that way. Um, so how you would do that, the very first step of it to get to that part is um, somebody with admin permission is going to need to be able to do this for you. But if you click on your little down arrow up here for your company in Slack and you hover over tools, you'll click on customize and it'll say your work name right here. So you click on this customize button. What it's going to do is it's going to bring us into a screen like this. And this is like more or less some people can see you know, like your basics. I know at my own company, I could see like all of this kind of stuff, but I can't see any of uh, obviously the administration part of it. You need to be under this administration part of it. And there's a little tab here called member, sorry, manage members. You'll click on that, which is just going to bring me back to the exact same screen we were at. And obviously I don't have really anybody in there because it's just my own test account for Slack, but it would pull up everybody in your entire company, right? And let you know, some basic, basic stuff about them. And you might be thinking like, okay, cool, where's the member ID? Well, the member ID is actually only going to happen when I click on this export member list. And when I do that, it's actually going to pop up and uh, give me like a CVS file. And on that CVS file, it's gonna have a lot more details. One of those columns is going to be the member ID. So you literally just click this, it'll download into a CSV, and then you have all of the member IDs that you can take, which works really, really great because then you can take that same CSV, right? And map it and do a data load into your Salesforce. Um, that way you have all your member IDs, it's in there forever. And as new people get added to Slack, new people get hired, you can update that accordingly. So that's the very first step that you'll want to do of getting your list. Uh, obviously the second part before you do that data load, you need to have some type of field of where you're going to capture that. So we have our user object here in Salesforce. And on our user object, we have this Slack user ID, or you could name it Slack member ID, if that's easier for you. And obviously it's just going to display the user Slack ID, and then we're using that specifically for Zapier. So it's just a text, nothing fancy. It's just like something blank that we're going to put in so we can add that unique um, ID to whoever the user is. So we have that downloaded, we know who they are, we're going to data load it, we have a field now that we can map it to, awesome. So if I look at a specific user, right, if I go in here and I take a look at Buzz Lightyear, I have this field that pops up and now I have it data loaded in with this unique ID that I can now reference anytime that I'm going to do one of these zaps. If I wanna send like a direct message to somebody, um, or you know, I wanna call out a specific user, I now have their ID so I can always identify them. So it's just a little bit easier way to do it. Um, I'll get into it as we get into Zapier. There's some different ways that you can actually find who the user is through like email and stuff, but it adds more steps in your process. So I figured uh, trying to avoid that, make it a little bit quicker when it hits Zap, that uh, we might as well just store these in Salesforce. It's not a big deal, it's one extra field, it's not really anything that's doing any harm, so I might as well. So that's the way I chose to, to take action on this specific part of it. So great, we have those two things. Let's hurry and jump back over and see what we gotta do next. All right, so we got our Slack member ID, we got it all set up. The next part is, um, this one's kind of a little extra. This one's kind of your icing on the cake, if you will because it's not needed, but I can guarantee you, if you put this in, anybody when they get the zap, they're gonna be super grateful for it and they're gonna think that you're a stud for being able to add the case link in their form. So I figured I might as well throw this in because um, it's super helpful, like I said, and kind of brings it all together. I mean, it's great to get a notification, but how much better is it if you have a link that just brings you right over to whatever it is that you're referencing? So that's what we're gonna do. Um, you might have seen this when I was on this page before, but uh, more or less, this is how our message looks, okay? So we have a message coming in, letting us know it was closed one, and then I want all these different things on it, right? Letting me know case number, the status, the subject, but here's our little case link. Um, we, If we just click on this, right? I can open it, and you just saw it opened a new tab up here, and it'll actually bring me exactly over to that specific case that was closed one. So super nice that way, it brings me right into Salesforce. So I would highly recommend doing this. Um, it's what I 
preferred to do. So I'm going to show you how. This specific formula that we're going to use is good for all of them. So all you got to do is just basically copy what I got here. And the part you're going to edit is down here. Um, specifically, this part right here. Uh, sorry, just kidding. Not that one. This one right here is what you're going to be editing. Uh, and this just obviously depends on whatever object you use. In this case, I'm using a case. Uh, but if you're using an opportunity, you would literally just replace this with opportunity or account or lead, whatever object you're using, you just replace that one thing and you're good to go. So uh, let's jump over and take a look at that. So you guys can see how this looks. I went into my object on in Salesforce. I went to the case. I created a new field. This is going to be a formula field. And if we hit edit here, it'll pop this thing up. So basically I have this, it's always going to be the exact same that allows me to uh, reach over to Salesforce. And then I'm adding in this tail end of it to the actual URL. So I want it to go into lightning because I'm in lightning, right? Not using classic. Um, and then I'm actually taking the case. And like I said, if, if this was your opportunity, you would just do that. Just put in opportunity, right? If it was your account, you do the same thing, all that good stuff. So you just change out whatever object you're using here. ID, this is smart enough to know that it's grabbing the case ID, right? So we're gonna send that stuff into to Zapier. So all of that is already taken care of. So basically this ID portion is going to grab the specific case ID that I'm looking at. Um, I think we, let me go back over here and actually pull this up. So we can make a little more sense out of it, of what I'm looking at, okay? So here's our uh, case that was closed one that we wanna know about. This case was there, whatever, we changed it to closed one. We wanna let the person know who was owning this case that, hey, it's been closed out for you, okay? So when I'm looking at this URL, that long formula part is basically grabbing all that for me. And then the plus part is grabbing the tail end of this, like I showed you. So if I uh, jump back over here, you can see here, this is that whole first part of it. And then the tail end is that starting with lightning. So we have lightning, case, ID, view. And if you look over here, it's the exact same thing, right? Lightning, R, case, and here's the ID that it's going to be grabbing, and then view. So that way it allows them to connect to this specific case that was actually um, shot over by Zap. So that's what that formula looks like. And it's really nice because, um, like I said, you can basically copy this entire thing. And the only thing you really should have to change is your object here. So pretty straightforward on that. Um, so we now have this case detail link set up. We obviously will save it. It's a text. And that allows us to access that URL, um, which is, I think, the extra gravy there for you so that you can notify them through a, a Zap in Slack, and then they can get right over to Salesforce. Cool. All right, let's look at our next part of it. So we got our first part done with the custom fields that we needed to create to be able to make this happen. Now we've got to uh, start on our workflow rule. And as we do this, we're going to start introducing Zapier because there's some steps in Zapier that we will have to access to be able to get this all built out. So after I've created these two fields, the next part that I want to do is I want to jump over to my workflow rule. I have a workflow rule here obviously set up. I've named it what it's actually going to be doing. Uh, and I'm looking at my rule criteria of when this is actually going to fire. So I have all that stuff set up. It's ready to go. Uh, my next one over here is going to be an outbound message. So attached to that workflow rule, I have an outbound message that is going to go over to Zap or over to Zapier, I guess I should start saying. And when it goes there, it's going to give Zap or Zapier all this information so that that can be processed in Zapier and then sent over to Slack. So we're kind of connecting the two, right? We're, we're using that integration to say, when this happens, fire an outbound message, send it over to our friend Zapier, Zapier will get it, Zapier's then gonna process it and then send it on over to our Slack. So what we have here is our outbound message. If I click into edit so we can just see all the details here. Um, let's see, so I named it obviously the smartest thing I could, close one. Um, 
gave a description of what this thing is doing right here. And then this part right here, you might be a little confused of like what the endpoint URL is. Well, for Salesforce, the endpoint URL here is Zapier because that's where it's going. Zapier is gonna do the rest of the legwork for us. So all we're concerned right now with Salesforce is that it pushes it over to Zapier. So we need to hook it up with a URL to get it to Zapier, right? So that's what this thing is. And now your next question might be like, well, how'd you get it? Like, how do you get this thing? How do you figure that part out? Um, and that's where you're gonna have to kind of get into Zapier real quick and start building out your, your, uh, your workflow here. So gonna kind of switch gears to show you how this part's done. You get into Zapier. This is how it's going to look when you get in here. You're probably familiar with it if you know what Zapier is. You got your home page. You got your, your classic little button over here for creating a Zap. You obviously click on that. It's going to ask you to create one, okay? After you click on it, we're kind of in the weeds here because mine's already built. So this is what it's going to ask you to do. You'll get in here and it basically says, if I hit this plus button, this is what it's asking me to do. Like, what do you want to do with this thing, right? So our very first step was like, oh, well, I want to hook it up to Salesforce. You click on your Salesforce app. And if I do that, see how it just did the same thing? It's automatically going to start asking you the questions it needs to get the information from Salesforce. We already have this part set up, but since that automatically didn't pop up, I just wanted to show you how you would do that. Yours will automatically pop up, pop up if you just hit create a zap because there's nothing there, there's no information. So it's kind of like, what are we connecting here? So uh, that's what that will do. Mine pops up, right? I got my Salesforce stuff. And then it's going to ask you these uh, four questions here. Choose app and event. Well, my app is Salesforce. That's what I'm connecting it to. And what do I wanna trigger this off of? We have all these different options here of what you wanna do. I've chosen to trigger mine off of an outbound message. You can trigger it off different things in here, like a new record or an update field, whatever it is, right? I've chosen to fire mine off of an outbound message when it hits the zap. Great, we got that taken care of. Let's move to step two, which is choosing an account. You obviously have to hook this up to Salesforce so that it knows where it's coming from. So I have this hooked up to my test, my trailhead, uh, or my practice sandbox, if you will, um, to be able to hook it up to that Salesforce that's actually going to be firing this message to it. So you'll hook it up there. Um, after you've hooked it up, it will actually give you this webhook. Now you would just copy this, and this is uh, the URL, if you remember, from our workflow rule. This is now saying, okay, great. We know where it's coming from. We know when this is going to fire. Here is a URL that you can use to fire this over for us. Um, so if we go back to our outbound message, that's what this is. I have that webhook. I throw it into this endpoint URL. And now this is hooked up. So great. We have all the, the main points here. You can choose who to send it by. Um, it's obviously required. So uh, if this was like an actual work process for my company, I use like we have an API user. I just usually send it as that API user. Um, but you can send it whoever you want, you know, whatever makes sense to you guys. So I have this sending as Buzz Lightyear right now. Um, and then you'll choose your fields below. So if you're familiar with a workflow rule, which I hope you are if you're watching this, um, when you send it out, a workflow rule works specifically for that object. Um, so because I'm firing this on the case, I have all the case fields available to me. Um, and then I would choose which fields on that case object that I want to actually use and send out in this outbound message. So I've chosen to include all these different fields over here uh, to send out in the outbound message so that Zapier can use that information that I might see fit to add into like something else when I'm processing it. Maybe I want to include, which I did, the case number. So I'm gonna put that over there. Obviously we want our case detail link because that's gonna be the link to get us back over to Salesforce. So I've included all these fields and um, that's kind of the bulk of this entire outbound message. That's all I'm really worried about, sending all this information so we can process it. So we'll hit save there. Great, that's all taken care of. So you're pretty much done with all the Salesforce stuff. I'm saying pretty much because I, <laughs> I can't quite remember outside my head here, but I'm pretty sure we're done with this. 
So now we can move on to the actual zap part of it. Let's just jump back over here and double check it. So we got our workflow rule. We got our immediate action, which is our outbound message. We put our URL in there, put the fields. Great. So that's kind of what it looks like, right? Great. So I was right. We're done with Salesforce now. We can now move on to all the stuff that we got to do for Slack. Uh, we've exported the Slack user IDs. I showed you how to do that. You could check that out here. It has more documentation on how to do that. We put our Slack IDs in there, obviously, for our test case. So we're good to go. I showed you that Buzz Lightyear has a you know, text field on the user with his Slack member ID. So we got this part done. Number two is also done. So now number three, we're moving on to the Zapier portion of this. I've shown you how we can like set up some of those apps um, when we're firing that. We got to log in, obviously, to our Salesforce. We did that. Uh, we determined our uh, trigger and hooked up the webhook. We've done that. Um, great. So now let's just walk through the rest of our zap. That's pretty much what all the rest of this is talking about. So let's walk you through how we would do that. We're now into our zap. We've hooked it up. Great. Once it's hooked up, what this will actually ask you to do that I should mention is you put in this URL and before you can get to step four, it will actually say test. Um, I think it's like review and test. And when it says that, basically what you have to do is you have to go over to Salesforce and you have to fire that event. So in other words, I would have to go over to the case and I would have to mark some case as closed one so that that fires off. And basically what it's doing is it's making sure that what we just set up, that connection, is actually connected to Zapier. Um, and then once it gets that information, once it finds that test that we send in, this find data pops up, right? So it'll say like, hey, do you wanna load another one? And it could see like, hey, I've only found this one, but if I fired one right now, it would say, oh, I found request B um, that was just sent in right now. So you can change your information if you have to adjust things in Zapier, like you have to possibly you know, reword something or you want to add more information to your outbound message or something like that, well, then you're going to have to go over to your case, change it to closed one, since that's our trigger, and fire this off again. Once it gets here, it will actually have that second request and we can use that information instead. In this case, we're good to go with request A that has everything that we want. We don't need to rework anything. Everything's set up the way it needs to be set up. So we're good to go here. Um, so it has that information. Cool. All right. So then you would just hit uh, continue from there and you're done with the Salesforce app setup. That's all you got to do for this. Next is uh, another one of those like just cleaning up the process. Technically, now that I have this information, I could just send it right to Slack if I wanted to. But... I don't really want to. And the reason why is when I look at this data, if I'm looking at the case, um, what was it? The case detail link. If I'm looking at this, it's fairly long, right? Like I, it's kind of long. And when it pops up in Salesforce, it breaks it into two lines. And I didn't really love it. I didn't really love that it was that long and kind of obnoxious that way. So this is just more of like refinement that I chose to do. And what I did instead is I actually, sorry, you close out of this. I actually added another app. So in, or, if you want to add another app, you just hit your plus button and you can search for all kinds of stuff in here. You know, any type of app that you want to use, you can hook it up to. But Zapier itself also has like some default apps that you can use, like a filter, a delay, formatter, which is like changes your currency or your numbers to something or adds decimals or commas. Um, so there's all these different things that they provide. And one of those is this thing called the URL shortener. And obviously it's just going to shorten our URL. So it's not too big of a deal, right? So we've added this app. It's going to kind of go through those same steps. All right, number one, what are we doing? Well, it only really does one thing. It's just going to shorten our, our URL. So that's what I want to use. And obviously I want to shorten the URL. It's kind of stupid that they have those two things, but they automatically populate with that as the default, so you can just hit continue. Once you have that part done, it's going to ask, like, obviously, you're shortening a URL, so what URL are we actually going to shorten here? 
And that's when you'll go into here. And when you click into this, I can like type, you know, whatever I wanted. But typically what you're doing is when you click into this bar is you're looking for data. So notice how this Salesforce is all of my data right now. So it pops up and it's like, okay, we have received information from Salesforce. Are you wanting to use one of those um, specific fields that you passed in with your outbound message? And it's like, yes, I do. I want to find the one that is the case detail link, right? I want to use that, which I have. You'll click it and it pops up here. And then that's the one I want you to use. That's the one I actually want you to shorten. Great. You have a URL. Once you hit this uh, retest and review, because I think when it first pops up, it's it's not going to look like it did anything. But if you hit your retest and review, it uh, it actually runs the app and then it will say, okay, cool. So here's your preview to what it's going to look like. You gave us this long URL. This is now what it's going to be. And in this case, it's perfect, right? Like we just want a nice short little URL so we don't have to access this huge thing and throw it into our, our actual Slack message. So we've now shortened it. So we're good to go on that app. Now our final one is actually hooking it up to Slack. So hooking it up to Slack, super nice, right? Because we're gonna fire this over as a direct message to somebody. So as you're noticing for all these apps, they're pretty straightforward. There's nothing super crazy about them. They give you easy walk through things to do on each app. And if you're using a new app that's not in this video, it's, it's more or less just kind of trying to get used to like what the information is that they're using and, um, and what's required, how you can customize it. But they're all very straightforward. They just give you like four or five, you know, quick steps of like how you can set this up. And every time you got to choose where this is coming from. So now we have our Slack. It's going to ask me the same thing. It's like, great. We have your Salesforce info. We know where that's connected. We've shortened the URL. Next is Slack. Where do you want to hook this up in Slack? So you choose Slack as our app, obviously. And what are we doing with it? Well, we're sending a direct message. I don't have to, I can send a channel. I can add a reminder. I can set a, uh, create a channel. I can do all these different things that they allow me to do, you know, and getting to something I mentioned on early in this video, we actually have uh, several different things that we could do to find that user. In our case, we chose to create a field called Slack member ID, and we now have that information in Salesforce. So I'm passing that information into uh, Zapier or Zapier, sorry, uh, whatever one it is. And um, we have that info. So I don't really need to know it because we already have the member ID. But if that's not what you wanted to do, there's different options. You can find somebody by a message. You can find a user by their name by their username, by their email, or by their ID if you happen to know it. So there's these different things that we can do and set it up that way. So if you wanted to add an extra step before you actually sent the message, let's say I didn't have that ID, I could add in here, sorry, I could add in here that extra step, which would say, yeah, I wanna go to Slack and I want to find somebody by their whatever it is, by an email. Okay, cool. So now what? Well, hook it up to my account because you need to go over to my account. So now that you're inside of my account, what are we looking for? Who's the email? Does it exist here in your Salesforce information? And sometimes it does, like you could pass over an email if you happen to have it more convenient um, and find them that way. Something that I found challenging when I first got into this is that at least in our company, we can like name ourselves whatever we want. So, you know, maybe I'm Jordan and, you know, a coworker of mine is his first and last name. Um, it could make it a little bit challenging or difficult that way to like know exactly what their name is. And I don't think anybody does this actually at my work, but um, I've seen people do it at past companies where you're pretty lax and slack and you don't care what people name themselves. And they'll name themselves something totally random. It's not even a name, like best salesman ever, right? And if that's their name, it's going to be hard for you to know because if they're changing it all the time and you have it set up to send to the best salesman, well, what if the next day he actually changes it back to his name? Now it can't find him because that's no longer his name. So I thought the Slack user ID was just the best way to go about it because that's never going to change. It's unique to the user forever. It's not reliant on anything. 
So that was the way I chose to go about it and why I chose to go about it that way. But there is this other option if you want to go that way to figure out, you know, what their email is or however else you want to find that user in Slack. Um, okay, great. So this one, in this case, we have the user's ID, like I said, so we're just actually going to set this up to send a direct message to them. Um, after we choose that, you saw me on the last step, you're going to hook it up to the actual Slack that you're going to be using. Um, and then from there, this is now pretty much the, uh, the whole thing that ties it all together, the very end, right? You have your message set up here and uh, what, whatever you want to do with your message and how you want it to title it. So in here, we have ours titled this way. This is something I thought looked clean, easy way to reference everything. Um, you can put whatever you want inside your message, but the message is actually this part of it. It's actually what's being sent out. So um, let's jump back over there real quick again and look at our message. So ours in this case, we wanted to reference our case number, our status, our subject, and our case link. So breaking that down, I'm literally going in here and I'm typing case number like this. And then I'm referencing the, the case number that we sent in from Slack, or sorry, from Salesforce. So when I come in here, I can insert data, right? And there's different options. Now that I have two apps, it's like, do you want information from that shortener or do you want information from the Salesforce app? I want information from the Salesforce app. So I click on that and then I can type in whatever it is that I'm looking for. So case number in this case. Okay, great. And then if I click it, it inputs it into our actual message. So that's how these all are set up. And the biggest one that will kind of get you if you're new to this is this case link. The reason I want to kind of reference that one here is because a lot of times you'll get in the habit of like, oh yeah, uh, the case link, you know, is from Salesforce. So let's go ahead and put that in. But that is our very first one we shipped in. It's not the one that we shortened. So that's the very long one. We don't want to reference that anymore. We had an app shorten that for us. So I actually need to go to the shortened URL. And then I want to grab that URL, right? And input it into there. Great. So we have our message. You can, like I said, title it whatever you want. You can add in emojis if you want. Emojis in Slack or, you know, start with a colon and end with a colon. So if I wanted to do potato, I could do that and add in an emoji, right? Like you can add in whatever you want. You could, uh, something else that I do, and we could even test it on this one. I wasn't planning on doing this, but what if you wanted to do something like this? You wanted to turn it into like a code look? You could do that. You could go um, put one of these little things that's in the top left-hand corner. I don't even know what it's called. And uh, if you put those two marks uh, surrounding the actual information, it'll turn it into a code snippet. Uh, let's change this one to like bold. If I, I do the asterisks, I can change it into bold. Um, you know, you can do all these things, right? And we'll, we'll leave those two, but you could italicize, you could do whatever you want. And that makes it, in my opinion, better to read in a lot of cases, because if you want to highlight something specific, um, you can turn it into something else so that it's a little more visible in that actual message. Okay. Uh, so great. We have that, uh, we have our message done. Now this part of it, you're always, in our case, we're sending it as a bot, right? The reason I'm sending it as a bot, uh, I'm not sending it as like another human or like another user or something like that. I'm just like auto-populating this message. It's just running automatically. So we're just gonna have a bot in Slack actually send this to them um, that you see over here, right? So it's just, this guy's a little bot and um, he's sending out this message to me. So we're going to have yes on the bot and then it asks you, you know, what, you, what do you want this bot to be named? Um, by default, it's just the app. Like it's typically just the app that you're using of, Hey, we're going to title it this for you. So if I choose nothing, it'll just be Zapier. But if I wanted to name it, you know, potato head, because that's the emoji we used, we could do that. And then when it appears, see how this says new deal and bold up here it'll say potato head. So in a couple like real life uh, use cases that we've used it for, if like, you know, it is a closed one deal. I think we actually have a process like that. Uh, I believe it says like new deal or, or something along those lines, right? 
um, just so that it's a little more apparent. I mean, that stands out to me when I'm looking at this. It's like the title of what's going on. So if you're sending a lot of these out, it's ideal to probably name it something clever that way so that as a as a user, I can just glance at this message and be like, okay, this is a new deal or this is a, you know, whatever it is that I'm receiving here. Um, same idea when we get over to our emoji. So the bot icon, I have it actually sending that potato head emoji. Um, we have a potato head emoji in there. How you want to reference emojis, right, is um, if we go in here and we click on our little emoji guy, all these emojis, obviously, you can type them out. See how it says down here in this, uh, I can't reference it, but see where the face is, and then it says astonished, but then it's colon, astonished, colon. That's how you reference it. So we literally have one in here, potato head, this little guy, that's potato head. And it will pop up as our little icon. You know, so for the purpose of testing here, let's do like a cash one. So money bag. So let's change this to money bag. And it'll have that pop up. Whoops. So you want to type it like this, money bag. One. Great. Now when that pops up, that might be also useful in like your use case, because if it is a new deal, maybe that makes sense to, to populate a money bag versus potato head, right? Because then they can look at it at a glance and be like, oh, a money bag. Okay, this must be like a new deal. It's just a little bit easier to reference that way. Um, the link to the zap, I always have mine as no. Literally, it just links you back to the zap. So, uh, you know, for like a user just getting a notification, they, they're never going to need to get into Zapier. So I always have mine set to no in most of these use cases. Um, you can attach an image if you want to. I, I never do that. You can have auto expand links. Um, you know, if it's a fairly large um, message, maybe you want to have that to know. You can change it to yes if there is a link involved and you just want to auto expand that and like show them. Uh, the best way to describe that is like if I go to the internet right now and I grab uh, a message or like a, a link to something online, like an article, and I send it to someone in Slack, what happens, right, is like when I send it, it auto expands and kind of gives me a preview of what's going to be sent to me. So that's like a yes or no there if you want to do that, right? Um, you can mess with this part of it, link username and channel names. It allows you to do exactly what's showing here to like at people. Um, so if I wanted to at someone, if I'm sending this instead of like a direct message, let's say I was sending it as a channel. Um, we've done that in the past as well, because maybe you want to like call someone specific attention. You know, it's going to someone, you have that information from Salesforce. I want to at so-and-so um, so that they get this notification when the bot runs, right? So it's also a good way to call attention in Slack. You can use that. And our use case here, though, we're sending a direct message. So I don't need to add anybody. It's specifically to a person. Um, and then you can also schedule these, right? So you can schedule it out if that makes sense for you. Most of all these apps that I set up and specifically this one, I want them to let them know or I want them to know instantly. I don't want them to have it at a specific period of time. I want to send this over to them instantaneously so I don't have a schedule on there. Once you hit done, it processes all of that. It gives me a little nice preview. It says, okay, cool. This is like what you're doing with it, right? This is what's going on. Um, you know, here's your information. Great. And then the biggest thing is you hit your retest. Boom. You can see how my little notification came up. So that means it worked. It went through. And if we pop back in here, those changes were made. So now we have it named potato head. We have a money bag icon here. Um, and then look at these changes. That looks really nice to me because it's like a number. So I could specifically, you know, come in here and grab that. It calls my attention to it. Uh, we bolded closed one. Um, so if you like that look, we have the subject. And then the biggest part, right, is we have our short little link here that I can click into and actually go to that specific case that was closed one. Um, so that's it. Uh, obviously on mine, this is like a test account that I'm using in, in Zapier, Zapier. And so I can't actually turn mine on unless I purchase it. I have to purchase my premium one. I'm not going to do that. So um, mine's just for testing, but uh, obviously you would hit turn on Zap. It would go green here and let you know that it's turned on. And then when you go back to your actual home screen, it'll say, hey, these ones are turned on and this is what they do. Just like you do in Salesforce, I would highly recommend trying to come up with a naming convention here so that you know specifically what it's doing. 
Um, you know, Zapier is obviously using all these different apps. So it may not be every single time that you're using this to hook up Salesforce. So you may want to come up with some type of naming convention so that uh, that works out the way that it needs to for you. And it's easy to find out what is happening inside of these apps so that you modify the right ones. Uh, the reason I want to call attention to that at the very last part of this video is because if I go in here and I edit the message, I know it's turned off, so it's not going to do it. But if I click on this customized message and it was turned on before, it will automatically turn it off because it's saying, oh, this person's making an edit. Let's turn this off while he makes this edit. And then after I'm done, it has to run through another test. And once I've tested it, then I can turn it back on. So something to consider there when you're doing like, you know, during the middle of the day, work day, like, is this okay for me to turn off right now? You know, is it okay to be off for X amount of minutes or however long it's going to take you to edit? Um, so yeah, keep your mind on that. But uh, more or less, that is everything that uh, is covered in here. So I will now link this video to here. It obviously has a little Giphy showing you how it works. Uh, now you have a full walkthrough that you can watch as well to uh, check this whole thing out.